thank you so very much for your flexibility this afternoon. I got your email and went, oh my God, <laughs> <laughs> my brain. It's been that way the past couple of days. I just can't, I think that I've done something and I'm sure that I've done it. And then I haven't done it and it, it's nowhere near done and it's never been done. I'm like, wow, was I so sure that I had done that? <laughs> <sighs> so what are we going to talk about today? Oh, uh, I can just jump around then with your career so far. Oh, okay, cool. I was surprised that you really hadn't done any other interview before. No, not really. Um, yeah, actually, I did my first uh, my first one this week for uh, Sky Brother Force, which is a podcast that Ray Chase. Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> um, so we did an interview um, on Monday, and that was the first that was the first voiceover related interview I'd ever done. I was like, oh man, this is fun. <laughs> So um, did everything start with a stove, stove top stuffing commercial? Oh my God, look at you with the deep dive. Wow. I suppose so. I mean, the, the apocryphal story from when I was a kid was that I was in a, uh, I mean, it's true, but I was three, so I don't have like a super clear memory of it, was a public service announcement for the Denver Police Department, which is where I was born. Um, and apparently there was a horse in it. And I was three, so I was, you know, significantly smaller than the horse. And I tried to direct the commercial because I just thought that I really understood where the horse needed to be in the whole setup of everything. And my, my mom said, yeah, that's, that's when we knew. That's, that's when it became clear. Mm -hmm. So you were technically uh, like already in SAG then before you could even like, like know what it, know what it was? <laughs> No, no, SAG, Stovetop, I think, would have been the first, would have been the thing that got me into SAG, for sure, because a PSA probably would have been non-union or okay. outside, of, outside of the union, non-union jurisdiction at all. Um, but yeah, Stovetop was probably this the first SAG job. And was uh, Summer of Ben Tyler before Kablam? I want to say, yeah, that was before Kablam. Not, not by a whole lot. Um, but yes, it was because I would have been, Kablam did all of their recording in New York and we were living in New York when I, uh, when I got cast for Ben Tyler. So yeah, that would have been first. What do you remember about your experience on that movie? Oh man, it was such a blast. It was such a blast. I uh, actually, probably the, the coolest thing that happened on that set was we got hit by a hurricane. Oh. Yeah, uh, we were filming in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is completely gorgeous. And our set, uh, one of our sets um, had this big, I mean, 200 something year old, massive, gorgeous oak tree, huge oak tree. And we heard on the news and, you know, the production obviously is keeping very close tabs on the weather. And they said, yeah, Hurricane Fran, Hurricane Fran is on the way. And they evacuated all of us to Raleigh, Durham or Raleigh, North Carolina. And they put us in a hotel, um, which we didn't, we didn't know when we got there, but the hotel was set into a dried lake bed. So oh. the hotel was actually in a depression. And Hurricane Fran, when she was done with Wilmington, destroying that 200 year old oak tree on our set, came to Raleigh and filled the parking lot of the hotel with like 10 feet of water there was eight feet of water in the lobby of our hotel um and snakes and snapping turtles and all of these animals that come along with eight feet of water and the hotel only had so much food because they don't plan that they're not going to be able to get in and out of their own front door or their loading dock and one of our producers his name was jeffrey coates i remember him he was the nicest man he had been out for the night, like visiting somebody or something when the storm hit. So he wasn't in the hotel. So he went to Walmart and bought like six of these military grade uh, rubber inner tubes, went to Costco, filled them with food, floated them across the parking lot and fed our entire crew for like three days. Wow. <laughs> it was, and as a child, I'm like, you know, eight or nine years old going, this is scary, but this is also probably one of the cooler experiences of my life. Does anything stand out by uh, working with James Woods and uh, Elizabeth? 
Oh. Well, I, I mean, I was so little. I just, mostly what I remember is, I remember her perfume. I know that that might sound odd, but I remember her perfume. And I remember how distinctive the feeling was to hug adults that weren't my parents. Like, I remember the moment of like filming it and going, oh, this is my mom, but this isn't my mom. She doesn't smell like my mom and she feels different, but she is for the purposes of what we're doing right now. This is my mom. Mm -hmm. um, but James actually wasn't in the hotel. He uh, was staying in a trailer. He had a, an RV or something, or he was at a nicer hotel. He was at a hotel up on a hill. Um, so he didn't, he didn't get caught in the eight feet of water. Good for him. But yeah, and Elizabeth McGovern had a little boy. Uh, she has a son, but he was, I think he was younger, younger than me when we were shooting. Um, yeah, I just remember that because that was my first big experience of having onset parents, like parents who weren't my actual parents, mm -hmm. and how unexpectedly weird that was. What about with um, which oh yeah, Office Killer. That's a that's a that's a fun movie. Office Killer is a seriously fun movie. <laughs> um, yeah, that I remember. I don't think in the original script we had that many lines. Me and the the other young girl that I was with, I think it was one of us was a Girl Scout. I want to say she, the other little girl, was actually a Girl Scout, and she kind of took the producers to task about, hey, when we knock on someone's door, like we have a whole script that we go through, we have lines that we say, and the producers just looked at us and went okay, yeah, do that. So we didn't really have much to say. And then she was like, actually, this is not how this works. <laughs> um, yeah, that was, I remember it was such a kick to play dead. That was, if I ever became a makeup artist, I would want to be able to do gore stuff like blood, bruises, big gashes, that kind of like monster sort of stuff. And that was my first, that's where that bug got started is because they were doing the ligature marks around my neck. Mm -hmm. And I looked in the mirror and went, oh, this is so cool. And then holding your breath while the camera goes by, like, I still can't watch horror movies. I get scared so easily and so immediately, but being in them, yes, being in them would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> One all recently, uh, you got to be in Seance. I did get to be in the seance. Yeah, that was a super, super cool project. Um, and yeah, Christopher James Kramer, the director on that, um, his parents actually owned the B&B &B where they shot. Like most of that is one location, this B&B &B in uh, Evansburg or Evansburg, Pennsylvania. Um, and they put us up and fed us and that whole crew just worked their butts off and it looks so cool. Like those effects, like in the very beginning when the table, the table spins, mm -hmm. just watching, watching people, because that's movie magic, right? Watching people figure out how to make it look like a ghost is moving the table. It, it's just so cool. It was a long, I was only there for about 36 hours. It was very, very quick. I didn't sleep. Um, really, really cool shoot, though. I had a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. Do you think you have a personal preference for working on um, more dramatic opposed to comedic projects? That's a really good question. Um, most of the film stuff that I've done is dramatic, but a lot of the TV stuff that I've done is comedy, like sitcom type stuff. Um, and I think, do I have a preference? I would say that I probably gravitate more easily towards drama, that the rhythms of that come a little more naturally to me. Um, and comedy is a lot of work, man. I don't, I don't know if a lot of people really know that because the job is to make it look easy the job is to make it look accidental or you know rhythmic simple off the cuff mm -hmm. and it's not it's a it's a very fine balancing act and that was a learning curve to be like oh oh okay <laughs> there are so many other things that go into play here and uh when you're working with people like uh, normal ohio john goodman and jolie fisher and orson bean and nita gillette i mean it's really hard to keep a straight face. I don't, I'm not good at keeping a straight face. And it was very, very difficult with those people. Mo Gaffney, Charlie Rocket. I mean, oh my God, Titans, amazing people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I was going to say that, uh, of course, uh, nor normal Ohio is kind of a, like way, way uh, ahead of its time. Mm, yeah, very much so. 
Um, my understanding was that John Goodman was getting a lot of fan mail um, from people who, you know, were gay or were, were not hetero identifying who had never seen themselves represented, who'd never, because there was such a stereotype, there was such an archetype, I guess, of what a gay man is and how a gay man presents. Mm -hmm. And John Goodman was not that. He was the opposite of that at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were responding to it going, hey, thank you for doing this and for showing us. And uh, again, I was young, but I remember going, oh, wow. Because at that age, I think it was like 14 or 15, um, those kinds of conversations were not in the mainstream, were not in the public the way that they are today. And those were things I just hadn't really thought about until you're confronted with it and you go, oh, well, yeah, I guess there would be lots of different ways to be this and feel this way and do this. And how cool that people are feeling seen. Mm -hmm. Really great. Was there a case um, early on where you were like really starstruck with who you were working with? Really starstruck. Yeah, there's an actress. Uh, she's primarily a theater actress, although she has done some really lovely film work uh, named Cherry Jones. Okay. Um, and I've worked with her three times, I think, twice or three times. And I remember I had seen her on stage. I had seen her work. And then I got cast in a, sh a show at Lincoln Center in New York called, called Pride's Crossing. And she was in it. She was the lead. And I remember just going, oh, my God, I get to work with this woman. Oh, my God. Um, actually, I think the cool thing that's happened through my career, because a lot of so much of the work that I did before I went to college, I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And all of the people that I worked with have gone on, like continued to do stuff. Um, or I have seen work that they did before I knew them, but as, you know, as a kid, I wasn't really exposed to it. And it's sort of like reverse starstruck where you go, oh, I already knew you, but now I'm getting to watch you do this role. This is so exciting. I know how cool you are, how good you are. And wow. It's like being really, being really proud of your friends kind of in a way. It's, it's fun. Mm -hmm. Well, and then with a uh, uh, Christmas memory, that was a really stacked cast too. Yeah, very much. Yeah, Eric, Eric Lloyd was definitely someone that I had watched because he was around my age, but he he did stuff. Um, Dunstan checks in that, yeah. that movie when he was eight, something like that. So I definitely knew who he was and I definitely knew who Patty Duke was because <laughs> Miracle Worker was a staple film in my house. Um, so yeah, that was fun. And I got to play a, I got to play a kid with kind of an attitude problem, which I didn't I didn't get to do very often um so that was really fun just to kind of go around and whenever the camera's rolling got to be a little bit of a jerk <laughs> that, was, that was really enjoyable yeah so what is what uh what uh was the uh, story of getting involved with the Kablam yeah Kablam was one of those things because it doesn't often happen or at least it didn't then it might happen more now where kids in animation are played by kids Mm -hmm. At that point, that was very rare. And I think it's still fairly rare, although like, I know that Disney tries to do a lot more like age appropriate, um, age appropriate casting for their stuff. But yeah, that I don't think initially that they were looking for kids. Um, but I came in and Noah Sagan came in. Uh, and I haven't, I haven't seen him since then, but he used to give the best hugs on the planet. Like, <laughs> top 10 championship level hugger, Noah Sagan. Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, that was an audition, a callback. I think we, I think we did a chemistry test, like where they bring us in together and just see how we are together. Do we get along? Can we play? Um, and then it was a job. It was a job like any other job. And I, and I, I say that it, it sounds kind of pedestrian, but what I mean is it was awesome. And just getting to go to work as a nine-year-old and be in a show, like, that's the greatest. Mm -hmm. It's the greatest. And then, yeah, and getting to watch them now, which is really cool, like getting to look them up on YouTube and watch them now as an adult going, oh my God, this, and again, this show, so ahead of its time. Like it was sort of the, the variety show from the 50s, 60s and 70s, but 
comics and geared towards a younger audience. And some of the jokes, like what well, Action League now, I think, like there's some really sophisticated, mature humor in there. Mm -hmm. And as a grown up, you watch it and go, damn, this show's good. I really want them to bring this back. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure you know too that just with the, like all the comments on social media that there's still quite a big following with it. Yeah, I'm I'm always really excited by that. Like when I when I meet somebody or when I'm at a convention and and someone like Ray often will bring that up, <laughs> and to see how jazzed people still get, how stoked people st like I, it's the best. It's fantastic. So I know uh, one of the last projects you did before. Um, taking a break from acting was a uh, judging Amy. Judging Amy. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That was, that was definitely a moment of being starstruck meeting Tyne Daly. Mm -hmm. um, she was one of those people that just had an aura around her, like just had a, a physical energy that she carried with her into the room. You knew when she came into the room, you could feel it. Um, very, very special, very talented performer. And yeah, that was another one that was really, like I say, gravitating towards the drama roles, gravitating towards the more, the more intense, dramatic, higher stakes stuff. I loved that role. I love that role. And do you, um, do you still pursue on camera as much as voiceover now? Or do you have an affinity with one over the other? Um, they are very, very different skill sets. Mm -hmm. And the more, the more voiceover I'm getting into, you know, as, as a grown up again, because as a kid, sometimes you just, you learn this stuff almost by osmosis and you don't realize. And then as an, as an adult, you go back and you go, oh yeah, okay, this is different. And I'm a little rusty here. And oh, this is really clicking. Um, affinity for one over the other. I would say probably that live, live performance has definitely got a special place in my heart just because you get that immediate energetic feedback from your from your audience uh, and that is that's really really fun but voiceover is doing such I mean voiceover is really having a renaissance right now video games um, vi I, I would say video games in particular especially with all the crazy leaps in technology that they're having with motion capture to performance capture um, like how detailed they can get on the face and mm -hmm. It's a really exciting time to be part of this industry in particular because so much good writing is happening. So many of, of the performers are just absolute top caliber performance wise. And then you get to make them look like aliens or you get to, I mean, these creature actors are unbelievable. Like physically what they can do is just nuts. And then all the technology, you can layer a skin on them and it's, you're literally creating another world. And that is, I think, a really exciting crossover that's starting to happen between traditional filmic stuff and more voiceover-based stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, like especially with COVID and everything that's going on with quarantines and restrictions and rules, and no one really knows what, <laughs> no one really knows what the plan is. Um, voiceover is a really, really happening place to be. Mm -hmm. So I would say at the moment, yeah, the affinity is there, but I am, I am producing, I'm producing right now, I'm producing a feature right now. So that's, that's my, my foot in the more live action on camera world. Okay. This is probably obvious to ask too, but um, was LA always the end goal for you? <sighs> no, actually. Um, LA, I came here for pilot season when I was... 14, somewhere in there, 13, 14. Um, but we had been living in New York uh, and I sort of grew up in New York and just love it. I, I still really don't like having to park anywhere because I'm so spoiled by just getting on a bus and it'll drop me at the door of wherever I'm going. Um, you can walk the whole island in a day if you choose to do that. Um, but no, LA was a place that my whole family really liked. Like my mom wasn't crazy about Denver. My dad didn't really like New York City that much, but everybody loved LA. Everybody was very excited about being here. My dad found a wonderful job. I was doing pilots, you know, I was doing a lot of TV. Um, in LA, I think with a lot of people, this is what happens. People aren't 
from LA most of the time. Like, obviously there are people who were born and raised here, but the majority of people that I have met are transplants. Um, but I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere else. So I guess I'm sort of an honorary native at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but no, L LA is, LA is a good hub, but I want to go everywhere. I want to live in Prague and I want to speak French and go live in Paris and see what their theater scenes like. Yeah. So I know that you and Ray met at USC, but is there a funny story about how you guys met? Uh, we met in a directing scene. I was in a directing class and I needed actors and he was recommended to me and called him up and of course, you know, he showed up and consummate professional, absolutely polite, knew all of his pieces, knew all of his lines the day he showed up to the first like meet and greet, which very few people do. <laughs> um, and he just asked me out over and over and over and over. And I kept saying, no, I'm, I'm not going to date in college, which, you know, ho hopelessly, non-follow-throughable idea to not date at all in college but he just kept asking and the summer between our sophomore and junior year junior sophomore junior senior somewhere in there the summer we were trading facebook messages um and his initials r and mine is j so he started making a romeo and juliet joke and i just thought he was like being a Shakespeare nerd. And I thought, oh, fun Shakespeare jokes. Yay, I can do this. And uh, so we spent the whole summer trading these messages with, you know, Romeo and Juliet subtext and got back to school. And he said, so can I take you to dinner? And I was like, no, we've been through this. Why do you keep asking? He said, Julia, Romeo and Juliet, the whole summer, Romeo and Juliet. And I was like, oh my God, I've been flirting with you for three months and didn't even realize, oh, Oh, I do like you. Oh my God, I like you and I didn't know that I liked you. Oh, yes. Yes, you can take me to dinner now because it was just, it was there the whole time and I just had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. I know uh, uh, you guys are good friends with Kyle and Caitlin too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because Kyle was at SC with us. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, Caitlin, I think she and I first met at a con and I remember meeting her and going her, oh, wow. Well, yeah, she's great. She's <laughs> super cool. Cause have you, have you met them? I've interviewed both of them. Yeah. Cool. So, I mean, you know, they're just down to earth, lovely, awesome people. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have a mutual friend, um, Anthony Turk. You know, Anthony Turk? Because he's originally from Minnesota, and I'm in I'm in um, I'm outside of Minneapolis. That's amazing! Oh my gosh, yeah, he's been he's been my friend for oh my god, like twenty five years, <laughs> twenty five <laughs> years. Oh my god, that's a really long time, Chris. Ah! I actually met another unbelievably nice, down to earth, cool fellow from Minnesota last night, and he reminded me so much of Anthony. That's so funny that. Wow, how did how did you guys meet? How do you know him? Well, I, have, I've, I haven't um, met him in like real life, but for a while now, because uh, back when I um, was starting out with interviews, he helped me get um, DD Pfeiffer since he uh, manages her. So yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> that is so cool. See, wow, what a small world. I love hearing that. Thank you for telling me that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have to reach out to Anthony now and say, now it's official. I'm talking about you. <laughs> so then um, what was your first any kind of like anime or anime game role for voiceover? That's a good question. And I honestly don't know that I can answer it in terms of what was my first. I know some of my first sessions like out of college were for uh, Mad TV. Mm -hmm. Um. Gosh, my first anime, that's a really good question. And I don't, I don't know. I don't know what my first one was. Well, I know it was a, like additional voices, but you got to be in Final Fantasy 13. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even put that in the same category as, uh, as anime. I was like 
compartmentalizing my brain. Yeah, that was seriously cool. And that's one too that keeps that keeps coming up. Like that's one when Ray and I um when we reconnected after college, he was like, You were in Final Fantasy 13. And I said, Yeah, yeah. I went and I did additional voices for the director. And he was like, That's like a really big game. That's kind of a really big deal. And I went, Oh, cool. Okay, well, how are you? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that was fun. I'm pretty sure I did a couple of accents for that too. I remember preparing those accents, making sure that they were that they were on point. That kind of makes me think to ask, uh, so far, what do you think is the case with voiceover that you've had to um, alter your voice the most significantly? The most, yeah, I did one game where I, ha- where I, it was actually kind of a rough choice on my part looking back because I auditioned with this sort of very scary ghosty sort of thing and it booked it and it was cool, but man, that hurts after two hours, <laughs> your <laughs> voice, your voice really starts to rebel. Um, the most significant change, uh, it doesn't sound it, but the mowlings from Star Control, um, okay. where it's just this little sort of creature who's up here and always oh, really excited about dying. It's sort of like if Luna Lovegood was a species of little aliens, mm-hmm. that's who it is. Um, but yeah, I haven't done a ton of creature stuff and creature stuff is the really intense altery. Mostly it's a uh, pitch um, and then an accent, uh, regional dialect, if they're looking for something like that. Okay. Well, with, with uh, anime, was um, Seven Deadly Sins pretty early? Pretty early? No, Seven Deadly Sins was only a, a couple of years ago, I think, like two, three years ago. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that actually came up on my interview for Sky Brother Force with Ray. <laughs> he <laughs> And Nero Basta in Seven Deadly was the answer to uh, a game that we were playing. And of course, I knew the line, but I couldn't identify which character it was. I could see, like, I could see, well, anyway, because I'm, I'm much more visual. So I was remembering, like, what the picture was in front of me, the big columns, there's room that she was in when she was saying the line. Um, but yeah, she was cool. I love the idea of playing a goddess. That was that and then Garuda in Final Fantasy 15 were both like, mm-hmm. you know, massive feminine goddess figures. And I was like, yeah, I could get used to playing this kind of character. This is fun. <laughs> I've also found too that people kind of have different answers as, as to um, how they took the dubbing. Was it difficult for you to get used to or was it easier? It's interesting. Once you can find the rhythm of the show, it gets a lot easier. Um, but finding lip flaps and finding the right translation of the line that also fits the shape of the mouth that you're working with is it's an art and there are pe- there are people who are just unbelievably good at it mm-hmm. um it does take a little getting used to it's not it's not impossible it's not one of those things that's just like overwhelmingly difficult but there definitely is a learning curve to it mm-hmm. the first few sessions i did i remember going I'm not, I'm not getting this. This isn't going well. <laughs> um, but yeah, w- once you find the rhythm of the show that you're working with, and again, so much of that too is the writers. So much of that too is the translation and the localization and the director that you're working with. I mean, I've been with directors who didn't have to change a line, like it all just flowed and it was seamless. And then there's some where the director's going to alter every single line to make it fit more perfectly. It's just, it's very... It's a, it's a case by case thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know that uh, both your characters in Fire Emblem were a, a while ago, but do you remember? Is, like, is there like a special story about getting those roles? Or I remember with Echidna, actually, I remember because when I did the session, it was all under NDA and you, obviously you can't talk about it to anybody, but I came home from the session and Ray was like, wow, you're in, you're in a really good mood. I said, yeah. I got to play this like hero, this resistance leader. She's kind of a big deal. She wears green and she carries an ax. I got to carry an ax. And I just remember thinking that she was so cool and getting, and getting to use more my natural pitch of my voice, which is lower. Um, so much of anime, there isn't really a call for that um, because the heroes, you know, you know, the protagonists, the main characters are usually much younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and then women in general are either younger or they have a much 
softer voice. And even if they're moms, they don't necessarily want you to be deep. They just want you to be kind of maternal and nice. So getting to play Echidna, who is a badass and a leader and self-assured and knows who she is and sounds like me, that was very cool. <laughs> With anime or like anime game characters you've played so far, who do you think that you um, personally relate the most to? Honestly, it's the most recent one that I've done. Um, Blue Period is a show on Netflix. I learned so much doing that show about art, about composition, about color, about self-expression. And those, because the, um, the teacher that I play, Oba, she's very, she's very good. Like she really, really knows what she's talking about. And she, she takes it very sincerely. You know, she applies herself and she's passionate and dedicated, but she's not dour. She's not serious. She's not you must do this. You must, it's very important to get a good grade. When the students are stressed, she makes a point of coming in and being like, okay, guys, everything down, everything away. We're going on a field trip. We're getting out of here. We're getting some fresh air. And she really does make an effort to empathize with them and bring them out of that serious, stressy, frightened place. Because we've all been there, especially when we're under pressure, especially when it's something we really want, we really care about. And to have a leader or an authority figure who goes, yeah, I understand that you're feeling that way. I validate that you're feeling that way. And now we're going to go have some fun because it's okay. Whatever happens, it's okay. And that is the truth. Like as you move past that big stressful moment, the truth is that it's okay. It's okay. And if you can just relax in that moment, give yourself a little bit of space in that moment, you're going to have a lot more fun. You're probably going to be much more successful. And I, I have been very, very lucky in my life that I've had teachers like that, that I've had, you know, authority figures like that. And you never forget them. You never forget them. So it was a, a total thrill to be able to play someone who's that emotional and that excited and that talented and that sincere about what she's doing and being there for her kids. Yeah. I loved her. I really, really loved her. What about uh, Tassalia? Sorry? What about uh, with uh, Desalia? I have to say, I don't, that's not ringing a bell. Can you give me a little bit more context? Oh, uh, that's a monster girl doctor. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is the thing. As soon as you say monster girl doctor, I'm like right there with you. <laughs> she, so that was, those were the sessions when it was actually really hard to keep a straight face because she's just off the wall. Mm -hmm. Like she's so dramatic. There's so much going on. Everything is a problem. Everything is really personal. And she just, like there are moments when you're laughing and then there are moments when you just want to smack her because the solution to her problem is so basic. The solution to the problem is stand still. Let the doctor do what he has to do. Stop kicking, stop screaming, stop throwing a fit. And she just, which again, I think we've all been there. Like we've all been in a position when the solution is really simple, but you're just going to have a tantrum about it anyway. And, that, and that's okay. <laughs> oh man, that show. Yeah. But the, that was one, that was one that it did get a little like vocally stressful at the end because, you know, multiple hours of pitching high pitched temper tantrums. It gets you after a while. You're like, yes, I think I'll take my 15 minute break. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Do you think that's probably the most fun with anime you've had so far? I mean, in terms of sheer like dramatic performativeness, yeah, she's right up there. <laughs> she's right up there for sure. I know you've uh, got to play Selena Berg in a villainess for a while too. Yeah. Yeah, she. Uh... She was heartbreaking because she's she was one where it's so it's so cool when you really when you think about anime when you think about the characters because it can seem sort of archetypal or occasionally oversimplified but when you think about it you go yep but I've but I've been there mm -hmm. I've been in the emotional situation that's being teased apart and depicted here and she she just wanted so badly to be good and to be right and to be enough. And I mean, my God, I think we've all been there and are there and are actively working on that specifically. So 
yeah, and it, it was cool also to be able to play the vulnerability of her too. Yeah, because that that is definitely something that I gravitate towards, and oftentimes I I go too far in that direction. I need to pull it back a little bit. But for Selena, it was nope, hard on your sleeve. Just she's she's just there. She's trying. She's always trying so hard and so sincerely. And yeah, she, she was kind of heartbreaking. You really do kind of want to protect her. Mm -hmm. What do you think with voiceover in general so far is the case where you've had to get the uh, most emotionally involved headspace? I did a live action dub a couple of years ago called The Valhalla Murders, which I think is also on Netflix. And the director that I was working with for that really loved to do long takes. Mm -hmm. Like he would, we'd watch, you know, a five or six minute scene and he'd say, okay, because I mean, you know, obviously you have the script in front of you and there's someone else in the scene with you. So you have a you have a minute to like check in if you need to. But he really loved to do just long stretches so that the emotion could be like as organic and flowy as possible. And the character that I was playing was the um, the lead, this Icelandic police detective. And she had a couple of scenes, at, which were the first scenes that we recorded because they were the, like the first scenes in the show where she's locked in a car trunk, like breathing, panicking, crying, trying to get out, literally thinking she's going to die, thinking she's about to die. And being able to break that up into pieces is one thing, but doing five minutes straight of putting yourself physically you know, breath-wise, vocally, physically, your body, your mind believes what your, your body starts to tell it about, I'm panicking, like there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. um, that was, that was very intense. Um, there is another one that's niggling at the back of my mind. I'll see if it, if it comes forward later, I'll, I'll share it with you because there's another one that's in there somewhere. Okay. I know with uh, Back to Anime, there's a lot of um, emotional stuff that goes on in Vinland Saga too. Yeah, super. Um, yeah, Vinland Saga, and what what's the uh, the second one? Because there's another um, Norse adventure saga series that came out at the same time as Vinland Saga. Um, I don't remember the name of it, but yeah, I mean, it seems to me like anything said in that part of the world, live anime, animated, whatever, is going to be intense. Like that just seems to be what what they do mm -hmm. you know north scandinavian finnish icelandic it, it's it's always going to have this deep heavy intense thing happening <laughs> um yeah but vinland saga i was in very very briefly i think i only did one session for them okay yeah because the the role the role was pretty small she was very localized so i really didn't get to dip a whole lot of toes into that particular pond. Well, there's another cool role with um, Hashiri in the Al Malloy case files. Oh, that was so fun. That one was really fun, yeah. Because that, that was the one, and then when we went back and watched it, like doing all those sessions, you think you know what's going on, mm -hmm. and then you go back and actually watch the show, and you go, wow, nope. I... I had no idea this this whole storyline that my character wasn't a part of, which is so complex and so deep and so important to the storylines that you were working on. But there's there was just so much information, and I love I really love that noir um, sort of Maltese Falcon. You know, everyone's got the hats and the cigarettes and the attitude, and ugh, very fun, mm -hmm. very very complicated story. That was one where I just went, okay, I'm confused. I don't understand this. I have, to, I have to rewind and watch it again. But that was a really fun one. Well, I know you got to be in the Fate universe before that with the first um, Heaven's Feel movie, too, as Cello. Yeah, that was fun. And again, a, a very small role. But when we got to see it, um, it was so beautiful. Like the art in that, the, the animation in that, just gorgeous. Like... I, I caught myself several times watching that going, oh, I want a poster of that. I want a still of that. I want to hang that on my wall. Um, yeah, and then there was a second film that came out that Ray was in that we actually uh, got to go to a theater and have, like, they, they put on a premiere for it. Mm -hmm. And we got to go and there were photographers and all these people and 
that was, that's always fun. It's yeah. That, that sense of like ceremony and presentation and moment is, is always a blast. And then to see work that you did on a 30 foot screen, like it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's it's pretty great. (laughs) So when did you first get involved with the uh, Pokemon franchise? Um, Also fairly recently, I would say that was like three years ago, maybe not even that long. Um, And yeah, that was something because I I really didn't grow up with cartoons. I didn't grow up with Pokemon. I didn't, I mean, I I grew up playing Super Mario Brothers on my Game Boy, you know, the big thick, Mm -hmm. they weigh like half a pound gray Game Boy. Um, That was kind of my only, that and Star Fox, because I had a younger brother and Star Fox was requisite. Um, But that was really my only touch in the video game world. And we didn't grow up with anime. We didn't grow up even watching like Saturday morning cartoons, occasionally Ren and Stimpy, but that wasn't. um, And so coming into Pokemon and doing a little bit of research and talking to Ray and starting to understand just the scale of the Pokemon universe is kind of mind blowing. Like, I mean, it's, it's massive and there are so many offshoots and so many, so many characters and so many I mean, I don't, I, I marvel at people who can keep all of those Pokemon in their head because they keep adding, they keep adding more and then they change their abilities and then, oh, well, no, in this universe, this Pokemon can do these 17 things. Like it's, it's huge. And I didn't know until I got involved in doing work, you know, voiceover stuff. And then doing that research, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is massive. This is very cool. Did uh, Masters come before Twilight Wings? I don't think so. I think Twilight Wings. I think Twilight Wings was first. I auditioned for uh, John. I auditioned for him. And uh, uh, yeah, Oleana, I think. In, yeah, in my mind, they're very separate because I remember auditioning for John. He was specific. And then Oleana, I think, might have happened while we were doing sessions for John. I think that's when those auditions came. Um, and again, she was really cool. I loved, I loved how deeply she felt things and how, how much passion there was in her, but it's all so controlled. Mm-hmm. Like her, the way that she deals with her environment is to know, to know everything that's going on, to always be available and never to have that mask break, which is actually very tough to do in real life. It's really hard to maintain that. It takes a lot of I mean, there are a lot of words for it, but I was fascinated by her. And then to get to play two characters that are that different, like John, again, young boy, hard on his sleeve, very clear, very open about what he's excited about and what he loves. And Oleana, you know, sort of a mature woman and just see, deals in a completely different way with the world in front of her. So getting to do both of them in the same franchise was very cool. And do you have a particular process for uh, boy voices? Because I've found that... Um... Of talking to other voice actresses that do boy voices that kind of have their own thing that they all do. Interesting. Um, well, I don't know if it's so much a process as like the specific age of the boy is very important because when it's when they're when it's young, young, like six to ten, um, that is a range where I think adult females can be really successful and convincing and have a lot of longevity with that. As they start to get into the teenagehood, it starts to get a little more complicated because male voices are different. And when you hit 12, 15, that kind of range, it starts to be really obvious that it's not a male voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and there, there are women who can do it and I take my hats off to them, they're amazing. But for me, I've always found the younger is easier to find and a lot easier on the ear of the listener like the listener doesn't go "Mm, that doesn't sound right um as they start getting older it gets a little more a little harder to find the right tone because men are different male voices are different it's sort of like that middle pitch area but they have a little bit of like that fry on it you know that kind of that huskiness that means that there's something else that's going to come there and but i just i just did it on both ends that's something else that you don't the clear high tone 
is either very young, like under the age of six or female. And the clear low tone is female immediately. Like if you're here and then all of a sudden you go here, obviously you're not an eight year old boy at that point, like immediately you're out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, yeah, the, the middle pitch is fine. Um, so lower voices for playing boys, I don't know if that would be an asset because unless you're playing a teenage boy and then you can, you know, just throw the husk on and find some um, pronunciation things that they might do differently. Cause another thing with playing kids um, is they don't enunciate. Like sometimes they slur things together. They take breaths in weird places because they're, I mean, their lungs are actually smaller. So they're not going to have the capacity or the training or the stamina to speak a whole sentence without taking a breath. So where does a kid breathe? probably not at a logical place because they're not following the logic of the sentence the way an adult is. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are all kinds of little tricks like that, that you can, that you can do. And again, it's an art. I mean, there's some people who make their living specifically doing kid voices and it's, it's amazing. Like you listen to them and you cannot tell the difference. It's very cool. Mm-hmm. I know uh, Levius is the last main one that I haven't brought up yet. Yeah. That was cool. And again, that one was fun because she was such a spitfire. I mean, she's just kind of a pain in the butt. Like, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Um, She's good. She knows she's good. She doesn't take any crap from anybody. And I think what the chemistry of her and, you know, Levius and their, and their coach is neither one of them takes crap from her. And she's really not accustomed to that. She's used to getting her own way. And sometimes when you are used to getting what you want, it can be really refreshing to have somebody go, "Mm, yeah, no, Mm -hmm. that's not how it works here. Like to give you a boundary um, that allows her to get genuinely close to them and care about them in a way that she hasn't really before. Um, and, And just like the steampunk aspect of that whole thing was so cool. Like all the, all the mech and all this like actual steam and then watching because the, the animators really took their time to show you like how each individual part is going to work to throw a punch. Just awesome. Mm-hmm. It made me, it made me want to go back, back and watch like all these boxing movies and Cinderella man and million dollar baby. And just like, it was really fun. Yeah. I, I, I'm hoping that that one comes back at some point. Cause it was a blast to work on. It's been a long time. So is there anything else that's um, upcoming that you're part of that you can safely talk about? Uh, yeah, I, I real I remember what my story was for the, like getting really emotionally involved in things. Okay. And I'm really glad that it didn't immediately come up because it is an NDA thing and I'm not, allowed, <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk about it. So I'm super, super glad that I didn't just immediately remember what it was. Um, yeah, well, honestly, the thing that's happening right now, cause it just had its premiere like earlier this month is that Sky Brother Force mm-hmm. is that podcast that Ray created with, um, Logan Burdick, who's, a really, really close friend of his from USC and a super talented screenwriter in his own right. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It Takes Two is a film that he wrote that uh, is out there right now that got made and got distribution. And he's working on another one that's like this close to getting getting what it needs to, to get made. Um, but yeah, Sky Brother Force was something that came up in the very beginning of COVID when when the quarantines were really heavy, like shelter at home, that kind of stuff. And Ray wanted to create. He was just getting like cabin fever, getting really restless. And voiceover as a community is so small. And there are so many unbelievably talented people in it. And he and Logan, I mean, I think literally in the course of like a couple of days, came up with Sky Brother Force, came up with this thing that they wanted to make. And Ray you know, very professionally and efficiently goes and starts contacting friends, talented people that he knows. And everybody from being in quarantine was like, oh my God, yes, we have to make something. I'm going crazy. And now here we are. And I I did uh, an interview for them on Monday and I listened to all of the episodes before my interview. And I was just laughing out loud. Mm -hmm. Like they are so, it's just so much fun and so much fun to be able to create with you know, Erica Lindbeck and Robbie Damon and Max Middleman, all these people. And you're like, oh, they're all, and Bryce Pappenbrook, Matt Mercer, like people at the top of the game. 
just having fun and doing such a good job and goofing off. It was great. It is great. I'm so looking forward to the rest of those episodes dropping. I can't wait to hear it. Well, then my, my final question is always asking, what do you want your own legacy to be? At the risk of getting too serious, a uh, legacy is something I'm trying to not worry about so much in my life. Um, I'm trying, I'm learning how to be much more just present with where I am and not worrying so much about what I'm leaving behind as what I'm doing right now, what I'm contributing to this moment right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And at least for me, it's that, that mindset and like working on that mindset shift has led to kind of an insane reduction in my anxiety. Um, cause I, I do the anxiety, depression, seesaw sometimes, and just giving myself tools to be more here and 10 minutes from now, 10 years from now, that will happen. The time will pass. So this, this moment is what I have agency over. This is where I can have an effect. So I guess if I, if I have a legacy, maybe it would just be looking back on my life, looking back on my day and being proud of it and getting to remember all the fun that I had and getting to remember the good relationships and the good moments with people Um, and good work, you know, work that I was proud of, work that I enjoyed doing that brought me happiness. Yeah, if my legacy is just being really happy, I think I'm okay with that and hopefully contributing to the happiness of the people that I'm sharing my life with. (laughs) Was there something that you want people to take away from your uh, performances so far? Hmm. I guess it's the being seen. I guess it's the, yeah, sincerity and I was, I was in a play uh, once uh, about 10 years ago and I had to play at that point in my life. I was, insecure and not self-assured at all um like you know very body conscious and always second guessing myself had a lot of self-doubt especially around the way that I looked and I remember this and this character was not like that she was very confident very feminine very aware of who she was and just lived in her skin very easily um and I had a friend of mine came to see the show and it was a great show and everybody was happy and flying and loving it. And she came up to me and she said, watching you perform made me feel beautiful. And she didn't say it like as a big, deep moment. She just went, Oh my God. And then looking at you and watching you, watching you, I I just felt so beautiful. I just felt, I just felt so good about myself. And I went, Oh my God, I, I did that for you. I gave you that. I gave you permission to feel that way. Wow. So that, that, and maybe it's not beauty. Maybe it's confidence. Maybe it's badassery. Maybe it's just, you have permission to be quiet. Like Selena Berg, you have permission to really want something that much. It's okay. Like if you do, then you do. And that's great. So yeah, because there's so many things that I'm working on in my life the confidence and self-assuredness and just presence like we were talking about before. Um, So if in my roles, I get to give people whatever in that character they, they need to pick up on, like if I can make it accessible for them and they can hear what they need to hear. Um, And then also just having fun. Like I want them to watch animes that I'm in. I want them to play games that I'm in and watch movies that I'm in and like it. Like I want you to have fun. I want you to enjoy because if you do that, then I doubly did my job. And that's, that's, that's the whole thing. That's, that's the whole thing right there. Well, thank you. I'm glad that we got to do this. I am too. And again, I really appreciate your communicativeness and your ease and your flexibility. It, uh, my heart was pretty much immediately in my throat when I got your email. I just, uh, so I apologize and thank you very, very much. Yeah, no problem. I'll be sure to send it to you once I have it up as well, if you want to see it. I absolutely want to see it. Definitely send it to me. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Have a great day. And I'll, uh, I'll tell Anthony that I talked to you. Okay. Great. (laughs) Okay. Bye.